Welcome back to the FNZ 90 Plus Free podcast, where free football supporters take a look into the dressing room, chatting to former professional footballers about their experiences on and off the pitch. I'm your host, Ashley Simons. Make sure you subscribe and follow our channel across our social media pages. All the details can be found in the description. Tonight, as always, I'm joined by two of the best in terms of me- <laughs> comedic value. It's Andrea Andy and Mark Tuxford. All good tonight, lads? Yeah, good, mate. Yeah, all good. All good. Yeah, good. Right, tonight we're joined by a player who scored over 100 goals in 500 appearances in the English game. Representing the likes of Chelsea, Newcastle and Queen's Park Rangers along the way, it's Gavin Peacock. Gavin, welcome to the show. How are you doing tonight? Very good, thanks. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Good to hear, good to hear. And am I right in saying you're, uh, you're joining us from Canada today? Yes, I am. Yeah, I've, I've been living in uh, Calgary, Alberta, uh, it's Western Canada, uh, near the Rocky Mountains. Um, and I've been here for the last 12 years now. So since I left the UK, I was working for the BBC after uh, I finished playing professional football. Um, and then I came out here to do uh, some theological studies. I ended up staying. And, uh, and now my kids are, have married Canadians and we're, uh, our roots are going down deeper. Though I do miss England. I get back for at least six to eight weeks a year and... Uh, I miss my friends, family, and, and obviously the football. Beautiful country, though, Canada. So uh, there can't be many regrets uh, about the move. It's a very beautiful country. I mean, lots of space and uh, stunning scenery. I mean, it's just pristine. I mean, people come from all over the world to, to holiday here. Um, but it does not It does lack football. It's all about hockey here, you see. Um, there is a... They, they actually have just started the first Canadian um, Premier League, they've called it. And there's eight teams, and they're hoping that you know if that's a, a success when the when the next World Cup comes around in uh, when they're going to share it with the US and and Mexico uh, that you know they can build again from there. But uh, but hockey's the big sport here. Well, let's try and talk a bit uh, a bit more about football tonight. Obviously, going over your career. So, as a brand new guest on the Night Plus Free Show, you won't be familiar with the format. So, let me set the scene for you. Imagine you're you're in a pub back in the UK. And you've had too many, one too many beers, and you wanted to share your stories with three complete randomness. Is that okay? <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Brilliant. So, Tuck will kick us off with the questions. Go for it, mate. So, Gavin, thanks again for joining us on tonight's episode. Um, we like to start these interviews off with a trip down uh, memory lane in terms of your love of football from a very early age. Um, so, your dad obviously played for Charlton, so I imagine the game was very much in your blood from a, a young age. Um, what were your childhood memories of watching football or supporting a team as a youngster? Yeah, I mean, uh, I was brought up in a footballing family, as you said, my father, Keith, a uh, professional for Charlton Athletic for 17 years, one club man. Um, he's uh, appeared more times than any other outfield player in Charlton's history. Uh, goalkeeper Sam Bartram just pips him for appearances, but as an outfield player, he, he appears more times than anyone else. And he was the first substitute ever used in English football. So on the day, I like to, to kid with people. So back in the day when men were men, you know, and you just, you know, if you broke a leg, you just ran it off because it was 11 v 11 and there was no subs. So, uh, the football league looked at it and thought, well, we're going to introduce the, the 12th man, you know, for tactical changes or injuries. And 1965, all the 65, my dad was the, the sub that day and he was clocked at coming on after 10 minutes or something. So, um, but, but having my dad who was captain at Charlton was a, was a great role model for me and a, and a great privilege as well, because, you know, I've got my early childhood memories of going down to the Valley, watching my dad train with the other players, being like the other players, like friends of the family and, uh, plus then my dad's coaching, uh, where he was one of those dads that, uh, coached me, encouraged me, uh, but never forced me, um, to, to play football or kind of, you know, with your dad as a professional, it could be a lot of pressure on a, on a young lad, uh, just encouraged me. And so it just naturally grew watching my dad play, you know, going to hear the roar of the, the crowd when he scored at the Valley and, and having that example around me as well. All I ever wanted to do was just follow in my dad's footsteps. So take me through uh, your youth career. So am I right in thinking that you started off at Charlton and obviously went on to QPR? Well, no, really. Um, I I mean, I started, you know, I played for my school team, uh, district, and then at uh, age uh, 14, uh, I I got the England schoolboy trials um, uh, after being uh, recommended 
after playing for Kent County. And, and on that year, I had Paul Ince, Michael Thomas, like I was competing against those guys. Paul Ince didn't make it. I did uh, into the final squad. Michael Thomas was my, was my roommate. So at 15 then, I'm an England schoolboy international. I hadn't signed for any club. So I was only playing for my school, my county, and, and England schoolboys. Uh, and then all the other players were signed up. Michael Thomas was, was signed already for Arsenal, and there were other, Kevin Pressman, I think, was uh, the goalkeeper was signed for Sheffield Wednesday and others. But I had looked like a choice of like, most clubs in the country wanted to sign me, Liverpool. I say small teams like Arsenal, Tottenham, you know. Uh, and I chose, uh, well, obviously they weren't small teams, but I chose QPR because QPR had Terry Venables as manager and the first uh, pl plastic pitch ever used. Uh, and it was a state-of-the-art, you know, new stadium. And they had, they were a smaller club, obviously, than Tottenham and Arsenal, but they were top flight and they were bringing players through the youth system. Um, so at age uh, 15, I signed schoolboy forms for QPR. And then a year and a half later, I left school after my GCSE. It's crazy. I was 16, just left school, and then I signed pro. And then I was in the in the world of professional football as a as a young pro at, at QPR. Yeah, so you obviously started off at QPR. Then I mean, take me through your time there. Um, you spent a couple of years there. Um, so what was it like then? Yeah, I mean, you know, the transition from playing even English schoolboys county football to being a professional is huge. Um, you know, you, you are full time. You're in with men. You're still developing physically as a as a teenager. Um, and it's, it's cutthroat. Um, so you've got to toughen up quick. Um, at the same time, it's a dream job that, you know, most guys would, you know, they pay money to, to play, let alone be paid money to play. I think my first wages was a um, hundred pound a week, uh, which wasn't bad. You know, I, I remember my mate from, uh, from the grammar school that I went to, he went and worked for the bank of England. I think he was on a hundred pound a week and I was, um, but, uh, all of all included, it was it was tough because we I was in the youth team. The next thing is to get into the reserves, uh, so I made it into the reserves, and then after about uh, two years, two and a half years, just before my nineteenth birthday, just after my nineteenth birthday, I got my first team debut. Jim Smith was the manager, and uh, and he put me in the first team. Sheffield Wednesday at home, and uh, and I, you know, I remember thinking. That's it, you know. I've made it. I've actually made my first team debut now, and and of course, then the hard work still has to happen because you've got to stay in the first team and make a whole career of it. Yeah. So then, um, obviously, from making your first team debut with QPR, you then went on to uh, Gilling on loan before making yeah. the, the move permanent. Obviously, um, your dad was the one that brought you to the club in the early part of your time there. Um, how did that move materialise for you? Yeah, it's a strange one because I'm a top flight QPR. I'm England under 19 international now. So the, my year now has come through. You've got Ince now is in there. He's playing for West Ham. I'm playing for QPR. Paul Merson's playing for Arsenal. Neil Ruddock's playing for Millwall. Uh, you know, I'm in the England under 19s. I got a contract at QPR, but I was in and out the first team and, I, and they weren't playing me in my best position, which I wanted to be in the centre of midfield as an attacking midfielder. Um, so a bit of impatience from me, I would say, uh, keenness to play every week. My dad is now manager of Gillingham in the third division, but they're a good footballing team. He brought, I mean, he had players like Steve Bruce, Tony Cascarino. Uh, they just missed out on promotion the season before. And I was living at home at the time. And I remember it very clearly. We came down for breakfast. I'm sitting there eating my breakfast. My dad's eating his and he's look, looked over at me and he said, uh, I've got some injury problems in midfield. How do you fancy coming on uh, for a month on loan? He said, and playing in midfield. And I said, yeah, I'd love it. Because I wasn't in the first team at that point. QPR was in the mill. And uh, so the decision was made over a bowl of weeks of uh, My dad knew Jim Smith anyway from the managerial uh, rapport they'd had when Jim was manager of Oxford and my dad played against them for Gillingham. And uh, he's, Jim agreed to it. And I really loved it at Priestfield Pre Stadium at Gillingham. Played for my dad. And made the, the move permanent, forty thousand uh, pound deal, and uh, but I was playing every week, and it was men's football, better than reserve team football at QPR. I play eighty games in like eighteen months, and then uh, Harry Redknapp bought me for a club record for both teams. I think it was two hundred fifty grand club record for Gillingham, club record for Bournemouth. Yeah, 
Um, so it tees me up quite nicely for my next uh, question for you. So, you know, obviously being managed by your own father, um, mm. to someone who's probably known as the father of football in some respects with uh, Harry Redknapp. He signed you at Bournemouth. Um, tell me what it was like to play for him and obviously your time at Bournemouth. Yeah, I, I remember um, there were a few clubs interested in buying me for, from Gillingham and uh, Bournemouth not really, you know, they were in the old second division, so one under the top flight, but not really a named team that you think, oh, that's a, that's a big move. But I remember my dad saying to me, just like, you know, you signed for Q, QPR originally for Terry Venables, this guy, Harry Redknapp, is a bright young manager. Um, and uh, I went to sign, my dad drove me down and Harry met us in his car uh, with a young, good-looking kid uh, in, the, in the seat next to him. It was young Jamie, uh, 15 he was at the time, Jamie Redknapp. Uh, we did the deal. Of course, Jamie was then in the first team within a year. At 16 years old, he was that good. And it was great playing for Harry. Um, he, he's he's a, a great motivator. He loves to play expansive football. He doesn't mess about. Like, if you, you know, it'll give you the hair dryer treatment if, if necessary. Um, but he's just, he, he's just a charismatic guy. And unfortunately, in that first season, we got a ton of injuries and we got relegated. Um, and uh, that was tough, tough for Harry. But the whole thing was brought into perspective that summer was 1990, Italia 90. Harry went out there with Brian Tyler, our chief executive, and there was a there was a car crash, and, and, and Brian died, and Harry was in intensive care for several weeks. So we were all the Bournemouth players are back up in the summer, you know, trying to get fit for for the next season. Uh, disappointing in relegation, but brought perspective because we didn't know if Harry was going to live. But he fought back and uh, came back, and um, we started the next season. And after two or three months, I was playing well, and Harry pulled me after training. He'd been on, you know, Harry's always on the phone, isn't he? I was always on his mobile phone. And he pulled me after training. He says, Gavin, Newcastle United have come in for you. Do you want to go? And uh, and I just knew it. I just got married a year before. We just got settled in a nice house on the south coast there. It's lovely down in Bournemouth. I told my wife, got to go to Newcastle. She, she burst into tears looking around. Just got settled in the house, you know. This is the footballer's wife's life, you know. Just got settled in the house. She burst into tears. She said, where's Newcastle? I said, he's up north and it's cold. I said, but we've got to go. It's a big club. And, uh, and that was my experience. It was a short experience of Harry, but, but one that I always remember. And obviously he turned out from Bournemouth. He's, he went on to become a great manager in the game. So you touched upon there uh, during your time at Bournemouth, the unfortunate crash that happened at Italia 90. Um, how difficult was it that next season, obviously, with you know, Brian's death and then Harry sort of coming mm-hmm. back to... you know full fitness essentially um how difficult was it in that period yeah i th- it's t- I mean, i'm a young guy 21 at the time uh at the same time you know just brought football into perspective you know it's it's a great sport the best in my opinion uh, but there are other things that are more important and, and people's lives are are more important and then to bring it close to home and harry's very popular with with everyone as well um, it just it was a sobering thing. Relegation was disappointed, but it was more important that Harry lived and very tragic that Brian died. And so I think it brought a focus to the club and, you know, uh, a resolve to the players to, to start well and appreciate what they had, not feel sorry for themselves that we got relegated, but to start battling our way back. And uh, for me, it was only a few months before I got a, a move to a, to a higher level. But, uh, you know, Never underestimate the, the 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 work and good that Harry Redknapp did at Bournemouth. I mean, look where Bournemouth have got in recent years, and uh, and now to think of Bournemouth as, as having been a Premiership team is, is is quite remarkable. So, Gavin, you spent three seasons at Newcastle, the first of two, of which it's probably fair to say they were struggling in what you would now, you know, class as the Championship. So before we get up into that, how would you sum up your time at Newcastle in your first two seasons? My uh, summing up my own personal time was just it just hit the ground running and and never stopped for me personally at, at Newcastle. My um, first ever football kit was a Newcastle kit. Weirdly enough, I mean, Dad 
we lived in South East London. Dad's playing for, for Charlton. But my dad's dad, mum and dad, that side of the family are all Geordies, born in South Shields. Uh, my granddad, Tom, World War II veteran, Navy man, uh, after the war moved south for work, worked at Fords at Dagnum on the, on the line there, you know, just proper working class. And, um, and so we, we never forgot the Geordie route, so we used to travel up there. And so I got a Newcastle kit and I've got a picture of me when I'm only about six years old. We're playing with my cousins up in Newcastle field somewhere. And I'm sitting there in the front row, Newcastle kit. So when I signed for Newcastle, it was like coming home to some, some degree. Uh, and my granddad said to me these wise words. He said, son, if you sweat blood for their team, those Geordie fans will forgive you many mistakes on the field because that's what they would do. And I think that's probably the case for, for every fan, for every club, you know. But you know what it's like in Newcastle. It's, it's fever pitch, working class, tough area, and football is everything. Um, and so I've, I started there. Jim Smith had t uh, was the manager there. So he was my old manager at QPR. I gave him my debut at QPR. Now he's bought me again and stuck me straight in there. And yeah, within a couple of games I'd scored. I was worked hard, got on well with the fans. And though the team was mid table to start with, they had some good players, you know, Mickey Quinn, Roy Aitken, Mark McGee, uh, some good players, but just couldn't quite, uh, get into that promotion zone, uh, but then the pressure started to mount. Uh, Jim Smith got sacked. Ozzy Ardiles came in. He wanted to play good football, bring the youngsters through, but we couldn't give end. So we were playing good football, but letting goals in. Um, and so it was very up and down, but I was scoring goals. Uh, you know, in my first season, I, I'm not sure how many I, I actually got. The second season was 21 goals. Um, and then Ozzy got the sack and Keegan came in. And, and Keegan's first task was to save us from relegation. And his second task was to take us to promotion. Yeah, so obviously I was going to I was gonna pick up on that. Obviously, during your time at Newcastle, in, in three years, you had four different managers. And, and obviously, taking into consideration Ozzy Ardilis there, and then Kevin Keegan came in. That season Kevin came in, you were the star player. I mean, 21 goals in around 50 games. You know, did you realise... Kevin was about to change Newcastle's fortunes? Yeah, I, I remember the day Ozzy was sacked. I mean, Ozzy was great. I mean, this is a World Cup winner, um, Maradona's mentor. So he's talking about some, he was a quality guy, quality career, quality man. Um, he was the one that pushed me into the diamond system and played me just behind the front two. He said, you will... He said, you're like a, he said, I think he said, you're like a rough diamond, needs a little bit of polishing. He said, I'll put you here, you'll score goals. So a lot of credit to Ozzy personally. And he brought players through like Steve Watson, Lee Clark, Steve Howie, Robbie Elliott. These are all players that went on to have significant careers. Credit to, to Ozzy. But when I remember he was sacked, there was a lot of tears that day because Ozzy was very popular. And I was driving back over the time bridge to go home and I heard on the radio, we've signed Kevin Keegan as manager. And I was like, Keegan was my hero as a kid, one of my heroes. Keegan and Hoddle were two heroes. I had posters on my bedroom wall. And uh, he got a, the next day training, had a, a team meeting. And he's only, you know, a little guy, but his charisma and presence filled the room. And he just said, he said, if you, any of you want to leave this club, you come see me now and we'll sort it out. He said, but if you want to stay, he said, we will survive. He said, and we will take off. And that was Kevin, you know, he just made you believe what he could see. Um, but the work was still to be done. I, I just uh, sum up Kevin as a leader of men who had the ability for great man management. So he could say one thing to motivate you, Ash, that might be different for Andy, that might be different for Mark. You're, you're all in the team, but you're different characters. So his first uh, game was Bristol City at, at home. They locked out 5,000 Geordie fans because it was just packed. They all came to see Kevin. Remember, Kevin had finished his career as a player at Newcastle and then gone off to live in Marbella for seven years. He, he hadn't been back in the English games. So he didn't really know the game too much or the players, but I was watching him go around the dressing room and he was speaking to individual players. And then he came to me. And like you said, I'd scored quite a lot of goals that season. He went, you're the man today. 
He said, you're the man. He said, Bill Shankly used to say to me, and I'm fed up. Bill Shankly was this great legend of a Liverpool manager, he was a father figure to Keegan when Keegan played for Liverpool. He said, Shankly used to say to me, just go out there and drop hand grenades all over the field. He said, you're the man. He said, I'm saying that to you today. And I burst down the tunnel. I felt fantastic. You know, Keegan's saying the same thing that Shankly said to him. He's saying it to me. I made a couple of goals. and So I, that's an example I was using. I say to people, Keegan's a great motivator of men. And I, when he got the England job a few years later, um, he, uh, Paul Scholes scored a hat-trick. I think they played at uh, Poland, at Wembley. And, and, Keegan, and Scholes said in the paper on the, on the Sunday, um, that same thing, Keegan's a great motivator of men. And I remember looking at that and saying, see, that's what I've been telling people for years. And then I read a bit further down, he said, he said to me in the dressing before the game, Bill Shankly used to say to me, just go out there and drop hand grenades all over the field. And I was reading that and thinking, oh, I thought I was special. <laughs> but you know what I mean? He knew what, to, you know, Skulls attacking midfielder could get a goal. Similar kind of character, maybe in some ways. Um, but he had that ability and he just made you believe that you, we were going to survive and take off. And first season, it went to the wire. We played Leicester away at the final knock-ins and we survived and then the next season we played well I would say even when I, I played for Chelsea I haven't played, I'm played in a team that played as good a football that was in the championship but it would have graced premiership no problem at all even well that's that's where we get on to the 92-93 season where yeah. Newcastle were absolutely flying and yeah what we would call the championship today the likes of Rob Lee came in from Charlton Andy Cole coming in I mean he came in and scored 12 and 12, didn't he, that season? Um, yeah, in January? Later, later in the season, he came. Yeah, in. later on in the season. Just to get you over the line. But, you know, the likes of yourself, Lee Clark and David Kelly, where you were all on fire that season. And, you know, it must have been a great year to be part of that team re responsible for getting Newcastle into the Premier League. It must have been so surreal. It, it was. And it's interesting, you know, the psychology of, uh, of football. The year before, we'd go out every game and and you'd be nervous for the game right and you would almost like wince at Saturday coming um and you felt a weight on you and heaviness you know the next season we start the, we hit the ground running and you couldn't wait for the next game you felt light you felt like you had all the energy in the world just so different but what he did Keegan and it surprised a few people his first signings were two defenders everyone thought oh Keegan's going to sign attackers he signed uh, Barry Venison and John Beresford, and then he brought Paul Bracewell in as a holding midfielder. Of course, Bracewell and Venison were champions, you know, and had that experience. Beresford was a bright, young fullback that was really good. But he said, I want to play out from the back, so I'm going to have football in fullbacks. And then he said, I want an anchor in midfield, so it's going to allow you attacking players to go on. Then he brought Rob Lee in, which was his best pound-for-pound -pound signing, I think he, he says. Uh, I knew Rob as well from because he was at Charlton. And yeah, I, so we've I, we've actually had Rob on the channel previously, and he, you know, he was talking about how successful you were at Newcastle together. Yeah, and did he tell you that I got him to Newcastle? <laughs> he didn't say that. <laughs> you know, obviously, the old adage, the old adage is that um, it was either Newcastle or Middlesbrough, and somebody told him that Middlesbrough was closer to London. So he said, exactly. Well, here's the thing: is that I, my dad was at Charlton. Knew Rob was coming out of his contract. Knew Rob potentially wanted to go to West Ham, which was Rob's, you know, that's his sort of boyhood team. Yeah. And, but I knew Rob was a good player. And my dad said to me, you know, you want to get Key in to, to, to speak to Rob. Um, so, but also Lenny Lawrence was at Middlesbrough. So Lenny was courting Rob, West Ham were courting Rob. Rob's come, I told Keegan, get Rob Lee, good player. So Keegan gets him up to, to speak to him. And, and he knew that Rob being a London lad would want to get back home, you know, maybe a couple of times a month, you know, after Saturday game, drive back home. So he told, he told you, that was time for, for Middlesbrough. It, it, Newcastle's further south and closer to London than <laughs> Middlesbrough. <laughs> so uh, I say, you know, a combination of Keegan's persuasiveness and Rob Lee's bad geography it got, got Rob to Newcastle. But Rob will tell you he, he never regretted uh, coming and... Uh, what a great player Rob was. Good, great lad as well. Very down to earth. Yeah. 
I mean, you you had a great time at Newcastle, but obviously following that season, promoted to the Premier League, you then joined Glenn Hoddle's Chelsea for one and a half million pounds and finished that season joint top goal scorer. Newcastle incredibly went on to finish third that season, Chelsea 14th. Joining Chelsea, did you have any regrets leaving Newcastle at that point? Uh, no, it was sad when I left Newcastle because I was club captain and we'd won promotion. I had a I had a contract there. But at the same time, um, my wife was pregnant with our first child and uh, we won promotion. Two, uh, a week later, we were riding down the, around the city, open top bus ride, 100,000 Geordies, great, you know, highest you've ever felt in your career. And then a couple of days later, she went into labor. It was very difficult labor. She was in uh, labor for two days, baby wasn't coming. And when he was born, he was born without his right hand. It was quite the shock. We, we didn't know, uh, we only had one scan in those days. And, and uh, so you can imagine, you, the footballers just are normal people that experience lots of different things that normal, everyone experiences. So are not immune to suffering in any way. And uh, so it's quite a shock, you know, and then we were concerned that there other things wrong. And Keegan was brilliant. I spoke to Kevin, he knew there was an issue with baby. And, uh, and after a couple, few weeks, you know, I just spoke to him and said, look, you know, we're from, London and my wife would like to get back down. It's our first child, be close to, to her mum. And he said, look, I don't want you to leave. Beardsley's coming in, you and Cole and Lee, Lee Clark play well with him. But if your wife's not happy, you won't play your best football. I won't outprice you in the market. So Kevin was very compassionate, talk about realizing there's bigger things in life even than football. And uh, Glenn Hoddle had wanted to buy me for, for Swindon the year before. Um, but when he got the Chelsea job, he picked up the phone. I was his first signing and it was just the right timing. And so it was bittersweet leaving Newcastle because I would have stayed probably if there hadn't been the issue with the baby. Um, but then going to Chelsea, I remember Kevin ringing me up as I was driving away from Newcastle. said, look, you're going to as equally a bigger club in, in many ways, um, but you will learn more, than pl- more from playing with Glenn Hoddle in training and on the field because he was player manager than anything else. He says he's a, he's a genius and he wished me all the best and uh, off I went. Um, so playing for Glenn and being at Chelsea, I was probably part of the King's Road revolution because he changed things around there. And I, yeah. we, weren't, we were a cup team to start with. Yeah. League was pretty average, but in the cup, we, we flew in the first year and I was scoring goals for fun. And they were all kind of winning goals as well. Well, this is a thing. I was going to get into the, the, the kind of cup side of things. Uh, Andy's going to talk more about, about Chelsea and your career there. But in terms of cup action, I mean, you're at Chelsea. And, you know, despite missing out on an FA Cup winner's medal that season, you helped, you know, helped them into the final. Chelsea, you helped them to the, the semi-finals of the UEFA, uh, UEFA Cup Winners' Cup in 95 and the semi-finals again of the FA Cup in 96. Was that one of your biggest regrets in your career, being as close as you were to silverware? Yeah, I think, you know, when you get, I mean, the, the first season there, we, we fancied ourselves to, we weren't as good a team as Man United. They'd won the, the double and they were better, but we beat them twice in the, in the season and I'd scored the winner both times. Uh, to be at Wembley is the place for winners, not losers, but um, I, I could take, still take something from it. You know, not everyone gets to play in a cup final, not everyone's got a runners-up medal, but you want to be a winner. Um, in Europe, the next season, I was captain a lot that season, um, and I captained them in that semi-final. And we did well because we were learning to play in Europe. We, we had to, that was when you could only play; uh, you had to play a certain amount of English players as well, you know, in your team. So you were a bit restricted. And Glenn taught us how to play. We were inexperienced, so to get that far w- was good. Um, and then the following season. Uh, yeah, that was a disappointment because not getting further because we had players like Ruth Hullett and Hughes and stuff and thought we could have gone all the way. But uh, yeah, almost. Yeah, and almost is not quite good enough. So. And so at Chelsea, you were playing, as you mentioned, under Glenn Hoddle when you arrived. What was He was a player manager as well. Something yep. we're seeing less and less of nowadays, especially within, well, definitely within the Premier League and Championship. It's something we tend to see lower down the leagues. What, what was that like? 
How how was that relationship with Glenn? Yeah, I, I got on very well with Glenn. Um, so different kind of manager uh, than Kevin Keegan. Glenn was this great visionary, um, you know, highly intelligent player on the field, and highly intelligent off the field. And he wanted to change the whole culture of Chelsea. We had a we used to eat tea and biscuits after training when I first went there. There was actually a, there was a biscuit rotor, right? So you know you had your day of the week, and why is he Dennis Wise was cap, you know club captain? He organised it. So you get a phone call coming in like Peacock's your day today. Make sure they're good biscuits, else you know you'll be on double shift next week. And you bring in a bunch of biscuits, pitch them in the middle of the dressing room. Big pot of tea was brought in afterwards. And it's like I've heard of now. Um, you'd be dunking biscuits in your tea, and that's how you refueled your body. Just like maybe you'd be on the building site. It wasn't too much different. Um, and Glenn's come in. He's gone like, none of that. None of the tea and biscuits. We'll bring in a chef. You've got to start to eat right. Now, remember Glenn had been to Monaco. He was under Wenger. He'd learned a lot of this diet. And he brought in a reflexologist. I mean, we'd never even heard of reflexology. You know, they... They're fiddling with your feet. We called him Tootsie because um, the ancient Chinese art of touching parts of your feet is stimulating. And you can imagine the, the lads are laughing. You know? They're barely feeling the guy touching their feet. They want a good massage. Um, but he had different ideas. And then a few afternoon sessions. You know? you don't do afternoon sessions during the season. That's for pre-season. But, and then he brought in the wing-back system. So different system on the field, different system off the field. And that's probably why it took a bit of time in the league to, for us to get going. But, and mindsets, to change mindsets. And bring players in that can play that as well. Take some time. But Glenn was just great self-belief. Uh, belief in what he was doing. And we had some good players. Good team spirit. And, um, and so getting to the cup final. So we were, nearly, we were bottom. We went bottom for a few hours. I think at Christmas, the first season he was there. And uh, I remember it. We were at Southampton. And Glenn was very, he was encouraging. You know, Peter Shreve, his assistant, always encouraged us, keep playing football, lads, keep playing football, it'll come. And I remember why is he getting up in the, in the dressing room? But he went, no, he said, don't be playing football. We now need to go out there and kick a few people in, in, the, in the language that Wisey would have used. Uh, and, and he was right, though, because, you know, yes, we needed to play football, but we needed to dig in a bit. You know, we needed to get close. We needed to make contact. You know, I wasn't a great tackler, but I could get close to people. I could be aggressive and get in people's faces. And, and from that moment, we turned around in the league. We won three on the spin, and, and it coincided with the cup run beginning after Christmas. And then we just went on under Glenn from, I would say, strength to strength, because you started to bring in better players, culminating in his third season with Hullet and Hughes and Petrescu and Terry Phelan. Yeah, yeah, you've said you, you, you mentioned you played with some good players at, at Chelsea. I think you've played with some absolutely unbelievable players. You've, you've mentioned a couple there. Um, Rude Hullet, Mark Hughes, Dennis Wise, Frank St. Clair. I mean, that, that, that's just, just re reeling out those names is a bit mad. It must have been a completely surreal experience being in and around these sort of players and having uh, Glenn Hoddle at the same time. Yeah, I'd add to that Zola. So even after yeah. Hoddle, Hullet took over for a while, I remember, and he brought yeah. over. He yeah. was, no, I mean, he's incredible. Hoddle was the best, you know, amazingly. Even though some, you know, like Hullet, more athleticism than, than Hoddle, but brain, Hoddle was just so different. He was just incredible. But I remember when Hullet and Hughes, we signed them in Hoddle's third season. And I thought, we are going somewhere now. Because and and they smashed the wages because they were on a million pound a year. I started, well, no one's get you know, the players in the first team on on a thousand pound a week, <laughs> fifty grand a year. Um, you know, Wh Wisey and I would go in and fight for an extra fifty pound on our win bonus with Ken Bates. That's the, that was the wage structure. But to to get Hollett and Hughes, no one was jealous because those guys were you know at a different level, and they were so strong. Like you see him in training, like Hullet. I always say to people when Hullet was on the training field, or even you see him in matches in the Premier League, he was like a man going and playing football in the playground with little boys because he could hold off two, three people, no problem. And it, he wasn't at his peak then, he was in his 30s. So Hullet was this maestro, uh, and then Hughes was this top centre forward in every way and gave us a, he gave us a focal point. And then you brought Petrescu in, Phelan. I mean, Dan Petrescu is a great player. Great, great player. 
um, uh, feeling. Um, this is under Glenn, of course, still. And we, we played Middlesbrough at home. I scored a hat trick in the game. We won 5 0. And it was our most complete performance. And Glenn said, This is what we will become if we can produce this consistently. Um, obviously, Glenn got the England job at the end of that season. Hullick took over, and, and then Hullick went on to win some silverware. Yeah, and and again, Hullip came from from playing with him. He became player manager. Um, I think maybe the third third one in your second or third one in your career, which is seems a bit unheard of. But mm. moving on, you went, you returned to QPR in '96. Yeah, having lost your place for Roberto Di Matteo, who was mm. signed by Rude Hullip. Mm. Was that a difficult situation or did you just feel like your time at Chelsea had naturally run its course? No, it was a difficult situation because I'd gotten well with Rudy as a player. Um, but just, I would just say in terms of, uh, of the man management, it was different to say Keegan or, or Glenn. Like yeah. he didn't really speak to me, brought in Robbie Di Matteo. Oh, I'm in love Rob, he's a great, great guy. Just go out for dinner and stuff. Uh, but then what it would be with Rude is that he would just, you'd be in the team and then you come in the next game and you'd, you'd look at the board and you'd be out the team, not even on the bench. And, and he bit, you know, he kind of blanked me a bit. Um, and I'd been, I played a lot of games for Chelsea and being club captain. So it really probably didn't afford me the respect maybe that, that I should have had. Not just me, you know, John Spencer, Dave Rocastle, um, another lovely man, uh, a good player. And um, maybe, I, see, if, if Rude had said to me, look, Gavin, you know, I'm going to a continental squad system. I, I've got Zola in as that kind of, sort of striker that can play off a front man. I've got Robbie Di Matteo. I don't really see how you, you, you're going to come in and out. Maybe you'll play 10, 15 games a season. But if you're willing to fight for your place and be in the squad, I would have, I would be up for that. But there was no communication. Mm. So, you know, that went into Rude's style. You know, if I met Rude now, I'd shake his hand. Uh, no problem. Uh, but it was just a bit disappointing because I'd loved it at Chelsea. Um, once that was the situation, I was coming out on my contract towards the end of that, in that final season. So Chelsea had to sell me to get money or I'd be a free agent. Um, QPR had just come out of the Premiership. Uh, Strasbourg were, were speaking to me. They wanted to sign me. So I was looking at the, going to, in the French leagues on the French German border there. I fancied, you know, maybe looking abroad. There were other teams, um, Wolves and others. And then, um, but Cuba just coming out of the Premiership, they had money to spend. Chris Wright was the chairman, the, the kind of uh, music magnet guy. Uh, they had Trevor Sinclair there, Andy MP, Alan McDonald. And they wanted to get me and John Spencer. And they were going for it. Bruce Rioch uh, was the assistant to uh, Stuart Houston. And so, and it was my first club. So I just went, I went back home uh, to, to Loftus Road. And that's, that was the reason for going back. At the time, you, you obviously went back to QPR and it, the, the aim must have been promotion back to the Premier yeah. League. Um, to say that didn't go to plan would be an understatement. Um, obviously, QPR did end up getting relegated in the end. Uh, it doesn't mean by any you know way, shape, or form that your your period at QPR was was you know hinged by any sense. But you know you were playing with the likes of Vinnie Jones, Razor Ruddock, Ian Dowie, Trevor St Clair. Whilst there, d- despite that, um, you were a part of a squad that you know in the end did get relegated. I mean, talk us through that. But Stuart Houston. Uh, who bought me? Stuart and Bruce, they, they we, we, John Spencer and I went in there and we changed it quick, like the atmosphere. We, you know, you're going into a team, a squad that's been relegated. We changed that and we were looking good for potentially the playoffs. We just missed out. We had Trevor Sinclair and with MP, like I was saying, we had some good players. Spencer was scoring goals for fun. I banged in quite a lot. But the second season was the season they thought, right, this is it. We've got to go for it. At the same time, uh, there were big clubs wanting to buy Sinclair. Sinclair wanted to move to the Premiership. You couldn't have, couldn't blame him for it. So he was looking like he was going to go. He didn't start off too well, and then Houston got the sack. Um, 
and uh, and then they brought in Ray Harford. And of course, Ray Harford is totally different style, very defensive. I would say more of a coach than a manager, um, and went a bit more physical. Uh, it didn't go well with him and John Spencer. So what happened is you ended up Spencer leaving, Trev Sinclair leaving, Dowie comes in, you know, strong, honest guy, but from QPR's fans' point of view, it's like a negative business, you know, Spencer's going and Sinclair's on his way. And it, it didn't really happen for, for Ray, uh, even though he went physical with Dowie, with uh, Neil Ruddock on loan, with Vinnie Jones. I mean, we brought Vinnie in as player coach. Vinnie, I and mean, this is the thing, when I played against Vinnie for Chelsea, against Wimbledon, Vinnie hated me. And Wisey was his big mate, because Wisey is my teammate. And I first time I played against Vinny, he's smashing lumps out of me, he's elbowing me off the ball, he's punching me in the face. You couldn't have got away with it now because of all the cameras. Um, VAR would have strung him up. But um, Wisey said, yeah, Vinny hates you. I said, oh, no, I don't even know him. But it was, you know, I was against him and he wanted to intimidate. And then I saw, when I went to QPR, I woke up, we signed Vinny as player coach. I was like, oh, no, that's my living nightmare. It's not only a teammate, but he's like, oh, he's a, a, in charge of me because he's a coach. And I went into the dressing room. He was in the dressing room before me that morning, and it was like, I was thinking, oh, no. He was like, all right, Gav, how are you, son? All right, we're going to tear it up in midfield together. And it was just like, if you're against him, you're his enemy. If you're with him, he'd go and die for you, you know, on, on the field. So Vinny was fine. Um, we did go a bit more physical, and uh, Ray, first season was not, not that great, and then the second season, Ray went after a few months, and then we brought Jerry Francis in. Now, Jerry was the hope, because I've played, as we've talked about, for a lot of good managers, you know, top managers, and Jerry was one of them. I mean, been an England captain as a player, and he'd done well at QPR and at Tottenham, was touted as an England manager, potentially, and I loved playing for Jerry. I really loved him. By this time, I'm now like in my early 30s. So I've still got, still got a few games in me. And I was playing well for Jerry. And Jerry got us going a bit. Um, and, the, and we just missed out on the playoffs. I thought we could go up with Jerry. And then there were financial issues behind the scenes. I mean, Jerry brought in Peter Crouch. Uh, people forget that sometimes, you know. Crouch was in the squad. Um, and I did enjoy playing for him. But once the financial issues hit, it was always going to be very difficult uh, for any manager. Ian Holloway came in and, and we went down. And in my final year, uh, I was the highest play, paid player, I believe, at QPR. So they're in administration. And I had a year and a half of my contract left. And I just, it wouldn't have been right to stay at the club. It was ham. And Ian Holloway knew that. If he got me out, he could get in three or four raw young players uh, for my wages and uh, and so I did a deal with the club and, and I thought this is the right time to retire now. I, I had a little spell at Charlton on loan in that final season, which was strange, being back in the Premiership for a while. It's just that Alan Kerber, she knew me. Yeah. And my dad was there as assistant manager and he has a few injury problems, Mark Kinsella and such in midfield. So he's come on loan for a few months. So I had a few months in, in the Premier League in that final season. Yeah, so one question that, I want to ask really personally looking into your career do you feel that your time in the Premier League was up when you left Chelsea because by no you know no means at all were you not one of those players that was contributing you know every season you were doing quite well do you think you left you left Chelsea and went back to QPR maybe too early um well yeah looking back on it you could say yes you could say what what you wait wait till the end of the season, you'd be a free transfer. You know, you'd have a number of premiership clubs you could have gone to. Uh, I was able to be playing the premiership longer, yeah. My thought was, I didn't want to stay playing in the reserves for the rest of the season um, at, at Chelsea. And uh, QPR had just come out of the premiership. Spencer was going, I thought it was a good chance. So it was a, it was a gamble to, to go to QPR to help bring up the club that I started with back to the Premier League, um, didn't, didn't quite work out. And of course then, you know, unless I was never going to get bought from QPR to go back to the Premiership, um, it was only going to go, if I go up with QPR, or like Ipswich were very interested. Uh, Wolves wanted to get me a couple of times. 
Um, so that nearly happened. So they were teams that were looking to get up. If I'd have gone up with them, I might have had a few more years in the Premiership. But definitely could have played played longer in the Premiership. But uh, so it was it was you know that's the ups and downs. I've had some real good highs and some and some downs. So when people talk to me about football, I can give them the whole gamut of ups downs. Cup finals, cup defeats, and uh, promotions and relegations. I know what it feels like. It's like a, I would say football's like a microcosm of life because we all have ups and we all have downs. It's just football is very concentrated. One question I have for probably possibly two um, before I hand you back to Ash would probably be I've listened to you this tonight, obviously talking about the players that you've played with and the managers that you've played under and things like that. And there's been a whole host of, you know, well-known names who've had great careers as well. But if you had to pick, you know, the first question being, if you had to pick the, the best player you've played with or the best player you've played against and the best manager that you've played under, who okay. would you say those were? Who, who those were? Yeah, so I, I probably alluded to it. I mean, I played with the greats like Hullet and Zola and, and such, uh, but I still say Hoddle. Just to play with Hoddle in that his first season there, he was a genius. But when he had the ball at his feet, he'd just drop his shoulder one way and everyone would go that way and he'd spin balls left, right foot, whatever. So I, I go for Hoddle. A player I played, best player I played against, um, I think in my time in the Premier League and in the 90s, it would be Eric Cantona. I, I think Cantona was king in the 90s. Uh, brilliant presence, score goals, strong, make goals, uh, did the unusual, and he was just a character. Um, so there was that one. And what was the final question you said? Uh, just, just the manager, really. I mean, for, for oh, Nick, I think it would probably, you know, without saying your dad, maybe, because he was your manager at one stage. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, you know, other than him, I mean, who would be the, the guy that you've played under and you thought, yeah, he's, he's the one for me? Yeah, um, I'd have to go for Keegan just to, just to edge it, just because, um, because he was this great man motivator. And what he did with us, I think I grew, I grew under all my managers, but I just really grew under, under Kevin. So I'm going to go for, I'm going to go for Kevin Keegan. Yeah, definitely. Well, Gavin, it's been great to have you on tonight. Um, I'm going to pass you back to Ash now. Um, he'll close. Thanks, Mark. It's been incredibly enlightening to have you on tonight. I mean, some of the stories we've heard um, just eclipse anything we've heard so far on the channel. I mean, we've had one or two players on who speak as highly as you do about Glenn Hoddle. And obviously his influence on football, you know, as a whole, is, is probably goes under the radar, I'd say, nowadays. So it's good to hear that. And we'll probably look into that a bit more on the channel. But Gavin... Thanks for spending your time with us tonight and thanks for coming on here and sharing your story. It's been, it's been brilliant. Oh, a real pre pleasure, Ash and uh, Mark, Andy. Thanks a lot for having me. Yeah, just take care in the future, mate, and good luck with everything, all right? Okay, thanks, guys. Cheers, Gavin. Thanks, Gavin.